points today, and Guardsman Products rose one and seven eighths. Guardsman accepted Lilly Industries' $23 a share buyout bid. The deal's worth $235 million. The big loser today was Millipore, tumbling five and an eighth to 38. Morgan Stanley cut estimates on Millipore, and people got out fast. After the close, uh, Millipore issued a response saying there are no business developments to explain the drop. Then La Quinta Inns fell one and a half after Solomon Brothers downgraded the stock from buy to hold and cut earnings estimates. In NASDAQ trading, the composite index up nearly 12, reflecting the rejuvenation in the high-tech group. Volume a little heavier than yesterday's, and there were 18 stocks up for every 17 down. Topping the NASDAQ's most active list by dollar volume, Intel rose a half. Cisco Systems jumped two and seven-eighths, benefiting nicely from an initial buy recommendation by the Edward D. Jones brokerage firm. Microsoft gained one and seven-eighths. Altera climbed five and 13 sixteenths, and Sun Microsystems slipped an eighth. Oracle bolted three and three-eighths higher today. High techs were definitely back in style today. Amgen rose two and seven-eighths. Morgan Stanley put out a strong buy on Amgen. And Premier Technology rose eight and a quarter. This is a new issue. Six and a half million shares were priced at $18. The stock opened at 26, hitting a high of 27 and three quarters. It's in the telecommunications business. Biogen gained three and a quarter today, and 3Com rose two and 13 sixteenths. Another new issue, Health Systems Design went public with 1.7 million shares priced at 13. The stock opened at 17 and a half. That was its peak of the day. The stock finished up three from the initial offering price. Exogen ended off three and five eighths. Cowan and Company downgraded the stock a notch. Exogen has doubled in price since it went public last July. It manufactures medical devices that accelerate the healing process in fractured bones. And Central Sprinkler sprung a leak. It ended down five and a quarter. First quarter earnings came in below last year at 31 cents a share from 39 cents. Bad weather and cost to complete its fittings facility cut into sales. Then over on the American Exchange, the market value index flirting with its old record at 570.16. Volume 17.9 million shares traded. That's down a bit from Monday. 13 more stocks down than up. Echo Bay Mines headed up the Americans' most active list. The stock fell a quarter. Gold prices in New York fell 60 cents to $394.60 an ounce. Then among the big movers, PC Quote rising two points today. And on the downside, Salem Corp dropped two and seven eighths. And that's the Wall Street wrap up. Jeff? The U.S. government is close to negotiating additional air cargo service with Japan, and that could lead to added passenger service as well. But the prospect of flying more people to Japan is pitting U.S. carriers against each other. Diane Esterbrook explains from Chicago. Currently, American Delta and Continental Airlines are strictly limited on the number of routes and passengers they can fly to Japan. That's because of a 44-year-old agreement between the U.S. and Japan that restricts both cargo and passenger service. Those three airlines are part of a coalition lobbying the government for a new passenger agreement that would increase service for all U.S. carriers to Japan. If you were to add three daily flights between the U.S. and Japan, it would add about 500,000 new passengers a year between the two countries and about uh, $500 million of new revenue for the airlines. But United and Northwest are fighting the plan. Under the old treaty, they offer nearly unlimited cargo and passenger service to Japan, and now they want to expand their ability to pick up passengers in Tokyo and Osaka and carry them to other lucrative destinations in Asia. But United and Northwest fear Japan will protect those extended passenger routes if it opens additional routes to the other U.S. carriers. It's very important that we have a set of rules that hopefully will allow us to grow and expand in this marketplace consistent with the demand that's being generated in this marketplace. Murphy says if the U.S. and Japan first negotiate an agreement that provides extended cargo service beyond Japan, a passenger agreement would probably follow the same pattern, thus preventing carriers other than United and Northwest from gaining added routes. But one analyst says there's no reason the U.S. and Japan should not negotiate a passenger deal that will satisfy all U.S. carriers. I really believe that the Japanese best interest is in open skies, ultimately, where you don't have these kind of issues. Uh, people fly uh, as they uh, want to fly um, to and beyond uh, the countries uh, involved in the agreement. Industry experts say securing any kind of passenger agreement with the Japanese could be tough. They say passenger service tends to be a lot more volatile than cargo service, so the Japanese are likely to be a lot more protective of those airline routes. Diane Estabrook, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. Coming up, our monthly mutual fund review with Jonathan Schroer of the Invesco Strategic Health Sciences Fund.
The U.S. Court of Appeals today handed down a major ruling on a First Amendment case involving Business Week magazine. The court said a federal judge erred when he forced the magazine to kill a story before publication. The story was based on sealed court documents in a lawsuit by Procter & Gamble against Bankers Trust. The appeals court said the ruling amounted to unconstitutional prior restraint. Jaguar today unveiled its first new sports car in more than 20 years. The new XK8 will sell for about $60,000 and replaces Jaguar's best-selling car, the XJS. Jaguar hopes the public will see the new model as the successor to the popular E-Type sports car of the 1960s. But the new Jaguar faces stiff competition from other luxury car makers, notably Mercedes-Benz, Porsche and BMW. Tomorrow on Nightly Business Report, the changing face of the American newspaper industry. We'll look at how newspapers are using technology to cope with rising newsprint costs. During the last quarter, leadership in mutual fund performance shifted away from high tech and into another area, health sciences. And the Adam Network reports that one of the top three funds in that sector was Invesco Strategic Health Sciences. Over the past five years, this fund has taken investors on a roller coaster ride although its big gains last year and 1991 far exceeded the intervening losses. For the past two years, Invesco's strategic health sciences has been managed by John Schroer, who joins us now from Denver. John, as we've seen, the health sciences funds led the market in the latter part of uh, last year. Do you expect that to continue in 96? Well, we look at a lot of things that uh, affect health care, and generally, if you look at health care from a macroeconomic standpoint, the relative earnings growth of health care, which is uh, relatively economic and sensitive should exceed that of the market. So we expect a lot of the gains that we saw in 1995 to be repeated in 96, albeit not at such a torrid pace. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that your fund invests in a broad range of stocks, everything from biotech to uh, health-related computer systems. Which specific areas and companies do you like right now? Well, one of the companies which is the top holding of the fund is HBO. Uh, it's a company which supplies information systems to hospital companies. Information is becoming the vanguard for healthcare competition going forward. Hospitals and providers need to be able to show exactly what they are providing, for what costs, and what is the outcome. Uh, with the government also playing such a large role these days in healthcare, uh, political pressures can have a big impact in your investing area. Are you positioning your fund in case healthcare reform should re-emerge as a campaign issue? Well, for 1996, we don't really expect a lot of uh, threats from a legislative standpoint to emerge. Uh, Bob Dole is, for the most part, going to be out of Washington until November of this year, and it's going to be very difficult to do anything which is controversial in health care until that time. So we don't expect any sort of health care legislation uh, until probably May of 1997. I see. Uh, we've seen that your fund's performance can be volatile. Uh, what kind of time period should a prospective investor be looking at before putting money into uh, the fund? Well, healthcare is driven by a number of factors, and, and the predominant one being demographics. This is a multi year uh, driver to healthcare, as well as new products, uh, which tend to have a cycle of also multi year. Uh, someone that's taking a longer term investment approach should look at something at least two years of the fund. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we are out of time. Love to talk to you further. Our guest has been John Schroer, portfolio manager of Invesco Strategic Health Sciences Fund. And finally tonight, Eric Schoenberg, assistant managing editor of Money Magazine, will host a special online session on 401k investing in the Nightly Business Report's chat room on America Online. It's set for tomorrow, Wednesday, March 6th, from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time. The chat room is in AOL's Nightly Business Report forum. The keyword NBR will take you there. And that's Nightly Business Report for Tuesday, March 5th. We want to remind you this is the time of year your public television station seeks viewer support. Support that makes programs like Nightly Business Report possible. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jeff Yastine in Miami. Good night, Cassie. Good night, Jeff. I'm Cassie Seifert in New York. We'll see you again tomorrow.
Nightly Business Report is produced in association with Reuters, which provides real-time market data and news coverage through a global network of journalists, photographers, and cameramen. And is made possible by A.G. Edwards, helping today's businesses grow with comprehensive corporate services, investment banking, and business retirement plans designed for their needs. The Franklin Templeton Group is a global alliance of over 110 mutual funds and investment products, including tax-free income funds, domestic and international growth funds, and money market funds. Digital, engineering networked information systems that help you approach the internet as one huge opportunity. Digital, whatever it takes. And by the financial support of viewers like you. Nightly Business Report is made possible in part by the Jefferson State Bank and the Joseph and Bessie Feinberg Foundation.